Here's a question. Do you want to freely and safely and legally use entheogens for religious and spiritual purposes? Yes. Good. Okay, you're in the right room. Because I can basically tell you this is a win. No problem. So before I go into where I stand, I'm going to briefly touch on laws in other parts. In Australia, we have two states that allow religious and spiritual freedom uh, under charters. Those are, or one's a state, the other is the Australian Capital Territory. Anyone here from Tasmania? No? Good. Because Tasmanian constitution includes something that looks like religious freedom, but it's not. It's actually... I'm not going to go into the legal reasons for it, but it won't give you anything. If you're from Canada, it's all fluffy bunnies and unicorns in Canada. Seriously, I wish I was in Canada because Canada gives you really strong legal protections. The government can rescind them, but only for five years at a time. So they've got to pass laws every five years. South Africa. Nelson Mandela is a real hero of mine, and I'm sure he's a hero of many other people in this room. When the South African constitution was introduced at the end of the apartheid era, one of the best constitutions on the face of the earth. Now, the only problem is that in the intervening years, there's been a bit of corruption with the um, government, and so the judicial system is not necessarily as reliable as it might otherwise be. United States, the First Amendment is a brilliant amendment that provides religious freedom. The problem is, as we all know, it's um, adjudicated by the federal courts and the, specifically the High Court of the United States, or Supreme Court, I should say. The problem is that Donald Trump is loading up the federal courts with judges of his own choosing. And the estimate is by the end of next year, that's by the midterm elections, he will probably have replaced more magistrates or more judges in the federal courts with his own dogmatic followers than Obama replaced in the entire eight years of his own um, time in uh, as president. So United States, again, it's a bit of a dice roll. European Union has very strong uh, freedoms. Uh, specifically contained within the Convention on Human Rights, which is the original sort of founding document, or one of them, and more recently in the Council of the EU Guidelines Promotion of Freedom of Religion, that dates to 2013. Now, a lot of people here would be interested in um, Britain. There's probably a number of people of uh, British descent here. Unfortunately, no one has got any idea what the hell's happening after Brexit. And as you'd be aware, England is one of the very few countries that actually does have an established religion. So whether they're going to be friendly to um, psychedelic or the use of uh, substances like ayahuasca for spiritual purposes after Brexit is not entirely sure. There have been wins in the EU uh, with respect to ayahuasca. And I'm not going to go into detail with those. You can Google them. The Aussie Constitution. Now, a lot of people go, oh, the Australian Constitution provides religious freedom. Not really. I'll read it out exactly. The Commonwealth shall not make for any law for establishing religion or for imposing any religious observance or for prohibiting the free exercise of religion and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for office or public trust under the Commonwealth. Now, that looks very similar to the American First Amendment, except it contains the word for. Now, what that means is that if you pass a law banning hats, then if you're Jewish or have a religion that requires wearing a hat, tough luck. So accidental barring of your religious practice under the Australian Constitution is irrelevant. The law has to be for the purpose of destroying someone's religion. And uh, so that's basically telling us that the Australian Constitution doesn't do diddly squat to help us in this arena. So, a little bit about me. I'm a mystic. A mystic is simply a person who experiences divine connection. With me, I experience it both with and without entheogens. But, you know, 90% of the people here are probably mystics at some level or another or have experienced significant mystical experience. So, when I say I'm a mystic, I'm not claiming anything. It's just a statement of who I am. I have a Bachelor of Arts Social Science, I have a Bachelor of Science with Honours and also have a Graduate Certificate in Career Education and Development. I also have spent over a decade in the Australian Army, over a decade using psychedelics and I've been an activist uh, in drug law reform um, since 2010. And uh, these days I'm actually 
unemployed, I'm homeless, and I spend most of the time that I um, am helping people. Like last week, for example, uh, I had a person get in touch with me who had no, no luck with psychologists or psychiatrists, so I'm helping him. Uh, next week, I'm catching up with someone who's got terminal disease and is wanting some assistance with respect to coming to terms with death, basically, and that's a pretty scary thing for us all. So, history of activism. I went public in 2010. I'd got sick of lying. How many people here hate having to lie about who they are? Yeah. I got into work and it, what'd you do on the weekend? I went on a trip. Oh, where'd you go? Mm. <laughs> and I, so one day I just changed my website and, um, and two weeks later I didn't have a job. In 2011, I informed all members of the Victorian State and Federal Parliament of my drug use. And since then, I've been attempting to engage with the state government on the issue. I've sent hundreds of emails to all the parliamentarians. They all know who I am. I actually have a number of friends in the, in the Australian um, political scene in the Victorian Parliament. 2012, I did a 28-day hunger strike that had absolutely no impact, although I did lose 14 kilos. So, 2012, 13, 14, I took LSD and magic mushrooms five times publicly, once in the Burke Street Mall, the other times on the steps of the Parliament House. And each of those occasions, the uh, protective services officers came along and said, what are you doing? I'm going to take acid. And what do you reckon they did? They went, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> off we go, because we don't want to, you know, this guy, we don't want to deal with it. And in 2013, to add insult to injury, I went into Lillydale Police Station on two occasions and Warburton Police Station on one occasion, which is, I was living up at Warburton at that time. And uh, I said, this is what I do. I take LSD, I use ayahuasca, I, uh, you know, I actually give this stuff to people and I run sessions with them and uh, please arrest me if you want. And they basically said, please get out of the station. <laughs> we have people that actually do things that we don't like them doing. Go away. You're not, a, you, you know, it's sort of like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, if they tattooed something they had, it'd say mostly harmless. <laughs> so... 2015, I founded, along with Nick Wallace and Ash Blackwell, the Community of Infinite Colour Australia Incorporated, which is a post-dogmatic religion. Now, unfortunately, it's gone into abeyance because as most people who know Nick and Ash would be aware, they're totally snowed under with their own drug law reform efforts. And uh, basically, a post-dogmatic religion is where I tell you, I haven't got a bloody clue what's going on, and you've got to figure it out for yourself. Because let's face it, what's the biggest thing that's wrong with the world today? It's people telling you they know what the fuck is going on when in actual fact, none of us do. I mean, you know, the first thing you find going into the psychedelic experience is you're clueless. Deal with it. <laughs> April 2016, I went to once again trip on the steps of Parliament House and this time the PSOs went, oh, actually, we'd better call the cops. So they did. And I got arrested in front of a group of year 10 um, schoolgirls, which was kind of disconcerting because I'd never been arrested before. And it was like they were looking at me like I was show and tell. But the cops actually were pretty good. You know, had a, had a great chat with them, had a great interview. Um, the interview is actually uh, live on YouTube if you want to hear it. A face caught at the beginning of this year, and I wasn't quite, the, wasn't quite able, to, and I'll go into what I'm trying to achieve in court, I wasn't quite successful. And so the magistrate, after I'd proven guilty, the magistrate uh, dismissed the charges and I said, uh, Your Honour, you might as well get straight back on the uh, Brumby, so um, I'd just like to inform you that I'm in possession of LSD. And he looked at me as if I was mad, and I probably am, okay? I do see a psychologist and she's clueless about what the hell to do with me as well. The three police officers, the poor bastards who arrested me the first time, escorted me out, re-arrested me. And again, we had a great chat. And Michael Bock was there in support, along with uh, Nick Wallace and a few others. So um, it was a great day had by all. Um, <laughs> then the beautiful thing was that um, my next hearing was on um, 420, which is? No, 420 is cannabis day, isn't it? And I thought that was pretty cool. So I then got a, another hearing on May 4th. Now, everyone who's um, been to university will know that May 4th is Star Wars Day. That is epic. On Star Wars Day, 
I managed to convince the magistrate that the legal argument that I was running, and I'll talk about it in a second, is valid. Okay? What I couldn't convince him, because on that day, unfortunately, no one else was able to turn up, is that I was important enough and that we are important enough for the matter to be referred to the Supreme Court of Victoria. So just think about that. There is a very low-hanging piece of fruit ready to be grabbed. Okay? And we can do it, but I cannot do it by myself. So this is the uh, Age newspaper article after I had myself deliberately arrested, basically. Greg Kasarik is a drug user who's probably too honest for his own good. This week, when he had a charge dismissed by the magistrate after pleading guilty, he volunteered to the magistrate's court. He was again breaking the law by being in possession of a drug of dependence. And Vice carried an article after the May hearing. And uh, this is Sasha, my tripping buddy, golden retriever. Unfortunately, she's a little bit sick at the moment, so, uh, but absolutely awesome. Uh, if you ever want a tripping buddy, get a golden retriever. My Drug law reform objectives are actually quite limited and some people really take offence at this. I'd really hope that people wouldn't. I'm looking for regulated access to transcendent compounds for religious and spiritual purposes as required under Section 7 and 14 of the Victorian Charter of Human Rights Responsibilities Act. Now, I've been abused by people online because I'm not arguing for recreational use. Okay, the reality is that I use only for spiritual purposes. You know, even when I've gone to Doof's and I've taken a tab of LSD and I'm dancing, I'm nine times out of ten in a spiritual transcendent state while I'm dancing. So for me to argue for recreational use would be like for some random reason argue that people should be jumping out of uh, planes with purple parachutes. If you want to argue with that, go for it. But the reality is this is what I'm arguing. Now, transcendent compounds... You're going to look at that and go, oh, not another word for psychedelics. Um, yeah. Basically, <laughs> I use it for a specific reason, and that is because I'm facing courts of law. I'm talking to politicians on a regular basis. I have friends who are politicians. A transcendent compound, that's an entheogen that is non-addictive, non-toxic, and psychologically safe in appropriate dose, set, and setting. Now, it includes what I call the big four. LSD, magic mushrooms, ayahuasca, and sacred cactus. And one of the reasons to talk about transcendent compounds is because I can guarantee you the first thing that people say to me is, oh, what about addiction? Well, no. By definition, transcendent compounds are not addictive. Oh, what about overdose? Oh, well, no, sorry. By definition, it's almost impossible to overdose on um, transcendent compounds. As a matter of fact, in the entire literature, medical literature since LSD came around, there's only been one recorded overdose of uh, a death overdose, I should say, on LSD. Those of you who know uh, Dr. David Caldicott, the uh, incredibly humorous Irish gentleman, uh, I did an email exchange with him a few years ago and we figured that he'd probably taken about 2,000 tabs of LSD conservatively. So, you know, if you want to kill yourself on LSD, you've really got to get $10,000 and then you know, enjoy it, I suppose. But the reality is that Transcendent Compounds allows me and allows you to talk about really what are the most important ones that most of us are using. Some people are using other substances, but it also excludes things like ketamine. Okay, ketamine is addictive. Ketamine is also potentially um, leading to permanent bladder damage. I don't recommend ketamine. It doesn't include marijuana. But then again... Marijuana's got thousands of people out there. They can fight for it. They can do what they need, okay? But it doesn't include marijuana because marijuana has the potential for dependence, okay? So this basically includes the stuff that historically we've all been talking about since the foundation of EGA, Entheogenesis Australis. So we get to the law. The law in Victoria is the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act. I'm not going to go through the whole lot, but the two sections that are important, the first one is section 14, and that gives us religious freedom. And basically, it gives us the freedom to demonstrate his or her religious belief or freedom in worship, observance, practice and teaching, either individually or as part of a community in public or in private. So when I go and take LSD on the steps of Parliament House, I'm practising my religion as an individual 
in public. <laughs> Gotta love it. Okay? Now, that's all cool. And you might say, but hang on, um, all rights have restrictions. You're right. And that's where we get to section seven. Section seven, and I've bolded the section here, a human right may be subject under law to such reasonable limits as can be demonstrably justified in a free democratic society based on human dignity, equality and freedom, and taking into account all other relevant factors. And in the act, you'll see that there's A to E, which demonstrates the relevant factors, but they don't actually change they actually improve what's written there. Demonstrably justifiable. What do you reckon demonstrably justifiable means? Science. And what do you reckon people have been doing ever since Albert Hoffman had his bicycle ride? Science. We have decades of science to back us up. And uh, that's why I put my uh, qualifications up there before, because I have an honours degree in psychology. So I can read the science and basically understand it. Um, now, the other thing as well is we've got some amazing people out there who are very generous with their time. So when I went into court, I had written reference, scientific references from Professor David Nichols. Now, this guy is an absolute guru. He wrote in 2004 uh, a paper called Hallucinogens. 2016, he wrote a follow-up paper called Psychedelics. And these are the best literature reviews in the classical hallucinogens. Okay, so this guy knows his stuff. Dr. William Richard from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. So he's been involved in the uh, Silas Island studies. Bill was doing research on psychedelics before they were made illegal. And uh, David, uh, he started his research in 1969. These guys have been around a while, they know what they're talking about. And of course, Rick Doblin, who everyone knows just how quality the work that Rick Doblin does and the amount of work that he's uh, put into it. And uh, Dr. Monica Barat. Anyway, the freedom of information request to the Victorian government demonstrated the Victorian government has never done any kind of analysis on the harm of these substances. So if you contact your local member of parliament or the minister relevant, they will tell you, yada, 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 community health, this, that and the other thing. They are talking out their ass because they've never done the basic homework that you expect to be done. In addition, community of infant colour, it helps that I have founded a post-dogmatic religious movement. It helps that I have a history of activism, including writings, protests. It helps that I deliberately have had myself arrested. And it also helps that the Victorian law is 100% on our side, okay? We get to the Supreme Court, we win. That's uh, just the nature of things. So my ultimate goal is a referral to the Supreme Court of Victoria to obtain what's called a Declaration of Inconsistent Interpretation under 36, uh, or Section 36 of the Victorian Charter of Human Rights Responsibilities Act. Now, that's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. I would still have a conviction then the government can simply ignore it because the charter is law, not constitution. However, as I pointed out before, while accepting that the legal argument was perfectly valid, the magistrate refused to make the referral in May purely because it was like, you're just you. There is no one else. So, the legal argument is sound, but the, over, the, end, the scientific evidence is overwhelming, but I cannot win this on my own. Like similar fights for equality by other minority groups, only the combined actions of a community is going to work. If you imagine anything, women's suffrage, slavery, end of apartheid, the recent um, you know, same-sex marriage, it was not done by an individual, it was done by a community. And that's what I'm telling you. This is winnable, but we need to act together as a community. It's not that everyone needs to get arrested. I'm the only bugger that needs to get arrested. But I need your support while I am getting arrested. Now, the other thing, I want people to stop talking about the war on drugs. There is no such thing as a war on drugs. It's a war on drug users. It's a war on every single one of you in this room. No one ever arrested a mushroom. <laughs> they arrest you because you have a mushroom. So don't use war on drugs. Make it very clear to everyone that you talk to and think about it because this is personal. Don't think this isn't personal. This is about politicians using people like us as 
a subgroup, a subhuman group that they can use to politicise the same way as they did before women's rights, the same way as they've done with blacks, the same way as they're still doing with Aboriginal population, the same way as they've done with the LGBTI community. Okay, so remember, this is personal. It's not a war on drugs, it's a war on you. And I think if you don't think that, then you're never going to get to the next step. Parliament changes our laws. Put your hand up if you've ever spoken to your local member of parliament about drug laws. So how the hell are we going to get change? I speak to politicians and I say, how many people have spoken to you? And they go, none. You know, if there's no votes in it, the reality is I've yet to meet a politician with the except of um, Fiona Patton who stand for anything except for re-election. If you don't get in touch with your local member of parliament and say, this is outrageous, if you don't support people, um, you know, like the Psychedelic Society or others, EGA, who are doing this stuff, then nothing will change. If we remain invisible, then you can forget about anything. You, you know, you'll go to your grave wishing you had drug law reform because you won't get it. Over the last several decades, you know, people have always been saying, oh, we'll get drug law reform soon. No, we won't. Until we mobilise, nothing will change. So, how many soldiers take to win the war on drugs? Now, I used to drive one of these when I was in the Australian Army. Um, awesome fun. Like having a 42-tonne rally car that just goes anywhere. Great. I couldn't believe they'd pay me to do that. But the reality is that there's four blokes in that tank. How many people does it take to keep that tank there? Hundreds. Millions. You got people to recruit the tank drivers. You got people to repair the tank. You got people to refuel it. You got people who need to put the food in. You got people who actually are in charge of moving them from one point to another. You've got 12 million taxpayers who are paying for all of that. That's what I say. Not everyone needs to get arrested. Okay, so the question Are you happy to be a permanent target in the rational, vindictive, and politically expedient war on drugs? No. Good. I'm glad you said that. Do you honestly believe without your help we'll achieve drug law reform in your life? No. Good. Do you want to help win the war on drugs? Yes. Good. And this is Eldridge Cleaver, American civil rights activist leader. There is no more neutrality in the world, and that really applies to us. You either have to be part of the solution or you're going to be part of the problem. In other words, don't let other people do your shit for you. And this guy, one of the most amazing thinkers of the ancient world, Hillel the Elder, he was the one who actually came up with the do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Jesus just plagiarised. If I'm not for myself, who is for me? And being for my own self, what am I? And if not now, when? And that basically summarised, if not me, who? If not now, when? And I'd like you to all think that. Because what I don't want to have happen is in 12 months' time, we have this conversation again and everyone's sitting there going, oh, that's right, I should do something. You know, here are my details. If you want to help me, and I need your help, because as I said, I'm unemployed, I'm living in a bloody tent in a camping site. Get out of my way, yes. <laughs> and oh, actually, I would like to thank also Ray, because Ray was the guy who paid for my A-frame uh, for my demonstrations, and that was actually a awesome contribution. So thank you very much, Ray. So I don't know if I even have enough time for questions, but uh, if we do or don't, I'm around for a while, come and see me, email me, ring me. Thank you. Yeah, I was really hoping they were going to do that on some levels because that would have given us the religious freedom we need under the federal law. Um, but uh, they aren't. But the reality is pretty much every politician I speak to wants change on drug law reform. They just need permission. I have got so much time to get arrested, it's beyond belief. Um, <laughs> Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in jail. I don't intend to do that, but 
Um, as I said, I'm perfectly happy to get arrested on your behalf. You know, I've done it once, you know, hey, you kind of get used to it. It's like going down a slide. Um, <laughs> look, the sort of help that I would like, I mean, as I said, you know, I mean, financial help. I don't know whether you might think it unfair that I'm living in a tent while I'm trying to do all this sort of stuff. It makes it incredibly difficult. Um, just to get here, I had to juggle my money so I had enough money to put in the car for fuel. Um, you know, community of infant colour. Um, you know, I did have four committee members. I don't have them anymore. So, you know, if you want to help in terms of resources, if you want to help in terms of your time, if you want to help just in terms of asking me, OK, how do I talk to my local member of parliament? Because there are a lot of people here who would lose their jobs if they stood up and said, I use drugs. So you don't need to stand up and say, I use drugs. You know, if you're a psychologist or a professional or something like that, you can stand up and say, hey, I'm an intelligent person and Mr. Parliamentarian or Mrs. Parliamentarian or Miss Parliamentarian, this sucks. Thank you.